Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Larry Mohn, president of the Manhattan Institute, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome our guest tonight, uh, t Dr. Thomas Sowell. Uh, Tom Sowell has been, since 1980, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and has authored more than 20 books and hundreds of scholarly articles, essays, and book reviews. He has a syndicated column that appears in 150 newspapers across the country, and he writes regularly commentary for Forbes magazine as well. It's an extraordinary record of accomplishment, and what makes it all the more remarkable in my eyes is that whatever topic Dr. Sowell tackles, he has the uncanny ability to hit the nail right on the head. His latest book, The Quest for Cosmic Justice, is no exception. As David Bowe has noted in his jacket blurb, the ratio of insights to words in this book is remarkably high. We certainly agree. Please welcome Dr. Thomas Sowell. Thank, thank you very much. I guess the first thing to do is to def define what cosmic justice is as distinguished from whatever other kind of justice uh, we may be familiar with. Uh, traditional justice, I guess we can summarize, at least in the American uh, tradition, as applying the same rules and the same standards to everybody. Cosmic justice is very different. It means equalizing the prospects of everybody. And those two things are not only different in concept, they are wholly incompatible with one another. If you apply the same rules and standards to everybody uh, in baseball, Mark McGuire is going to hit 70 home runs, and there are going to be other people who will spend an entire career without hitting 70 home runs, including people in the Hall of Fame like Luke Appling, who twice won the batting championship. So if you want the one thing or the other, you can go for it. But the one thing you cannot do is pursue the two things simultaneously. Or rather, you cannot successfully do that. The Supreme Court has been pursuing the two things simultaneously for quite a, quite a while, leading to a lot of five to four decisions uh, and inconsistent decisions. The requirements for the two kinds of justice are very different. The requirement for um, treating everyone the same is very simple. It's mass produced. Uh, the requirements for cosmic justice must be handmade and tailored to each individual case. Uh, it's much more complex, and it requires a much larger amount of government power. Some third party must intervene to determine whether the outcomes are right, whether the prospects are right. Words, the very same words, have entirely different meanings within these two frameworks. In fact, as I mentioned in the preface to the book, what really set me off a few years ago to finish it up was a discussion with one of my colleagues at Stanford University, who shall be anonymous in deference to the libel laws, <laughs> uh, who talked about a level playing field. And it became plainly clear that what he called a level playing field is what I would have called a tilted playing field, tilted so as to produce the results that he wanted. When we talk about a fair fight, that means very different things in these two, within these two frameworks. Uh, a fair fight by traditional standards means that both boxers observe the Marquis of Queensberry rules, and the fight is fair whether it ends up in a draw or one-sided beating. From the other point of view, from the cosmic perspective, it's fair only when the two fighters enter the ring with the same prospects of winning. Uh, John Rawls has um, sort of summarized and epitomized these two differences. He distinguishes what he calls fair equality of opportunity from merely formal equality of opportunity. Uh, traditional justice or fairness by Rawls' standards uh, means simply that people are, are judged by the same rules. But genuine equality of opportunity, as he calls it, cannot be achieved by this, uh, by this method. He's, instead, he says, undeserved inequalities call for redress. Uh, and obviously someone must have power in order to do that redress. Now, what's called, what I call cosmic justice has been called by some people social justice. But I think they're unduly modest because they're trying to correct not only the uh, inequities that they see in society, they're trying to, oh, to correct the oversights of God, or the defects of the cosmos. 
Uh, when, when some people are born uh, with physical or mental handicaps, they want to counterbalance that. And of course, that's not always caused by society. So that when Moral says that undeserved inequalities, he includes all sorts of things. And that, that opens up a very large area uh, for, uh, for others. You can find this perspective on uh, justice, the Rawlsian perspective, in many places, from the street corner community activists right up to the chambers of the Supreme Court. For example, a few years ago, a, uh, an admissions director at Stanford University wrote a book in which she pointed out that during all her years as an admissions director, she had never required students to submit achievement tests. Because some of those students, uh, she said, through no fault of their own, attended schools where they could not have acquired the, the skills necessary to do well on such tests. So she's trying to redress the inequalities, and therefore she would simply not require such tests. Uh, the, co the educational testing service is currently engaging in a, a renorming of test scores to take into account the social backgrounds and handicaps of the students so that the score will then, again, redress pre-existing inequalities rather than applying the same standards uh, to everybody. Uh, whenever I hear the notions of fairness in education, I think back to my own education. And I think, thank God my teachers were unfair to me when I was a kid growing up in Harlem. Uh, one of these teachers was a lady named Miss Simon, who belonged to what might be called the General Patton School of Education. Uh, I cannot even imagine that Miss Simon gave a moment's thought to my self-esteem. <laughs> Every word that we misspelled in her class had to be written 50 times, not in class, but as part of our homework, and there was always plenty of other homework from her and other teachers. And so you misspelled four or five words and you had quite an evening ahead of you. <laughs> Very little chance of listening to the Lone Ranger. Now was this fair in Rawlsian terms? And the answer is no. Like many of the children in Harlem at that time, I came from a home where nobody had gone beyond elementary school. I still remember what a big fuss was made when I was promoted to the seventh grade because I had gone further than anyone else. Uh, in later years, when I graduated from Harvard, it, there was no such fuss. They expected me to. <laughs> but fairness was never an option. There was nothing that Ms. Simon or anybody else could do about the fact that we came from homes uh, where we did not uh, have books and magazines and we were not as familiar with those words as people from other neighborhoods might have been. So that was never an option. Uh, Nothing that the schools could have done would have changed that. It would have been an irresponsible self-indulgence for them to have pretended to make things fair. If there's anything worse than unfairness, it is make-believe fairness. They could, like the College Board apparently is trying to do, pretended that we knew more than we did. And that would have made them feel good. It would not have done much for us. Instead, they forced us to meet standards that were a little harder for us to meet than it were for some other kids, but far more necessary for us to meet, because that was the only way out of poverty. Many years later, I happened to uh, run into one of the other kids from Harlem who w went to that same school at the same time. Uh, and by now, he was a, a psychiatrist. He owned a, a home in the Napa Valley and property out there. In fact, now he's uh, retired, living overseas with servants, while yours truly is still trying to make a living. <laughs> but as we uh, reminisced about uh, things that had happened in the old days and what had happened in between, one of the things he mentioned was that over the years, his various secretaries had commented on the fact that he seldom misspelled a word. <laughs> I told him that my secretaries had made that very same observation and that if they knew Miss Simon, there would be no mystery as to why we did not misspell words. Now, it so happens I became a high school dropout. But what I was taught before I dropped out was enough for me to score higher on the verbal SAT than the average Harvard student, which may have had something to do with my being admitted to Harvard 
and in the era before affirmative action was even thought of. What if the teachers had, of, those, of that era had been imbued with the present day conception of fairness? Uh, where would my schoolmate and I be today? On welfare, in prison, perhaps in a halfway house if we were lucky. And would that not have been an injustice? To take individuals capable of independent, self-supporting, and self -direct, being self-directed women and men with pride in their own achievements and turn them into dependents, clients, supplicants, mascots, Now the primary purpose of mascots is to minister to symbolize something that makes other people feel good. The actual fate of the mascot himself is seldom a major consideration. The uh, argument here is not against real justice or real equality. Both of these things are desirable in themselves. The only argument is that some versions of these things are simply impossible and that trying the impossible has costs and, and real dangers as well. Uh, after all, the people who manned the communist movement around the world before the Soviet Union was established didn't devote themselves to this cause for the sake of creating gulags and, se and secret police and territorial aggrandizement. They did it because they were seeking social justice. But what actually happened shows some of the costs and some of the dangers of that. Most ordinary Americans still have the traditional conception of justice. And that means the people who have this cosmic notion of justice must misrepresent what is happening as being a violation of traditional justice. And therefore, they must, for example, misrepresent test results as being either arbitrary barriers to advancement or deliberate efforts to perpetuate inequalities. As Joseph Schumpeter once said, the first thing a man will do for his ideals is lie. <laughs> the next thing he will do, and this is my addendum, is character assassination. <clears throat> those people who disagree with those with a vision of cosmic justice must be stopped in their view by all means necessary. And that, of course, includes character assassination. Uh, they must be bought, to use the verb of our time. Now, the people who are the victims of this atmosphere of character assassination are not simply those who are targeted. The whole society is a victim. Because you're not going to be able to attract into the public arena people who value their privacy, who value protecting their families from humiliations, uh, if, in fact, disagreements become simply grounds for smears. In a sense, the people who are caught up in the vision of cosmic justice are also victims. Because once having demonized other people, they really cannot go back to square one and re-examine the evidence and find out whether what they've been advocating has been producing the results they want or producing totally different results. And so they're locked into the vision. They have too much of a stake in it to ever uh, think, think about doing something different. I have a chapter in the book called The Tyranny of Visions, about how, how the vision becomes more real to people than any empirical reality. A classic example was one described by Paul Johnson, uh, Lenin. And Johnson pointed out that Lenin, although he spoke of himself as a representative of the proletariat, had in fact never set foot in a working class neighborhood in any of the cities he'd ever been in, inside or outside of Russia. He had never talked with the workers and had no idea what they believed about anything. I might add that, all, that uh, he also, after becoming the ruler of Russia, never set foot in Soviet Central Asia, which is an area larger than all of Western Europe, and in which all these doctrinaire schemes from Moscow were imposed for nearly three quarters of a century with devastating results. What he was devoted to was the vision, not flesh and blood people. A flesh and blood people were a complication on the road to realizing the vision. And as it turned out, if he had to kill a few million of those, that was just so much too bad. 
And of course, we've seen Hitler, Mao, and others with the same approach. Now, fortunately, we have thus far in this country had much more uh, milder versions of this. But you can see also this notion of looking for visions and the abstractions that go with those visions, rather than with flesh and blood people. For example, there's a great deal of uh, talk about income distribution. And you might think that this is talk about income distribution among people. It's not. It's talk about income distribution among abstract statistical categories. We're constantly hearing how the top 20% of the American uh, uh, income earners, households, um, make X times as much as the bottom 20%. But these are not people. In terms of people, there are 39 million people in the bottom 20%. There are 64 million people in the top 20%. These are not percents of people. These are percents of households. And households vary with income, with race, with time, and with all sorts of other variables. Uh, we hear talk about the rich and the poor. And what amazes me is how seldom they define what that means. Uh, I remember some years ago uh, talking with a lady who was discussing her financial difficulties. And I said, do you realize that you are among the top 10% of wealthiest Americans? And she looked at me as if I were crazy, but she was. But merely by owning a home in Palo Alto at California real estate prices, she was one of the 10% top. And if she wanted to move out into a, uh, into a tent with her family, she could, have been, she could have boasted of her being one of the richest people around. Unfortunately, if she wanted to move into a, an apartment indoors, also at California prices, she would have been worse off. Uh, most people have no idea what is meant by this top 20% who are so routinely described as rich, where that begins. And I, I just received, before I came out here from California, the latest census data. And uh, any household that has a total income of $75,000 is in that top 20%. That is, any husband and wife making $38,000 a year each is in that top 20%. Uh, these, these are the rich whose taxes we dare not reduce for fear of pandering to entrenched wealth. Uh, genuinely rich people and genuinely poor people, I think, would come to something like less than 7% of the total American population. And yet political campaigns and debates are carried on as if these were the two great classes in society. And the other 93% of us don't really count. Rawls has something which he calls the difference principle, which he says that no policy should be uh, advocated uh, if it does not help those on the bottom. Now, the problem with applying that in the American society is that those on the bottom don't stay on the bottom. In fact, no, no, uh, in no quintile of the income distribution do the people tend to stay there. People are constantly moving among these brackets. A study was done some years ago showing that at the end of eight years, more of the people who were in the bottom 20% at the beginning were now in the top 20% than remained in the bottom 20%. So you have this enormous turnover of people in these brackets, and yet the discussions of income distribution are always discussion of the relationships among those brackets, not among flesh and blood people. I think most of us, if, uh, if every millionaire in America went broke, and was immediately replaced by someone in poverty who became a millionaire. Most of us would consider that to be quite a redistribution of income. The way the numbers are used, that would be no redistribution at all, because the brackets would have the same relationship to each other as before. And they're talking about the brackets, not about the people who are moving among these brackets. In any case, uh, Rawls has what he calls a difference principle, that those on the bottom, he seems to assume that they're sort of permanently on the bottom. Uh, are the acid test of whether a policy is good. If this policy helps millions of other people and does not help those in the bottom, then it should not go into effect, according to Rawls. Now, if you have a fluid society in which anyone who wants to rise has a very high probability of being able to rise, then what you're saying is that you're making the well-being of those who don't choose to do anything be preemptive over the well-being of other people. It means that if someone were to come up with a policy that would benefit masses of people, that would enable, for example, every poor child in America 
to get the finest education possible, develop his talents to the fullest, that that policy should not be put into effect if it did nothing for some wino lying drunk in the gutter. And so what uh, Rawls calls the difference principle, uh, I call the wino's veto. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I, I think we have some time for a question, so uh, uh, I'll just uh, start. Well, I'll, I'll ignore. Uh, Joe? Joe Dolan? Yes. Uh, Dr. Shaw, I just got two questions um, related. Uh, one, what, what are your views on ed educational equity and also, for example, veterans' preferences? Well, what is know, educational equity? So uh, it's always nice to know what it is what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the notion that uh, school districts are not receiving equal funding per capita per student. And that, for example, in suburban areas of New York City, for example, uh, the per capita student uh, money might be $12,000 or $14,000, where in New York City it's possibly $8,600. It's, it's that kind of notion that those levels of funding should be brought into balance. And well, on... And the yes, veterans' sorry. preferences, of course, is that uh, veterans do receive, in some cases, advantages uh, because they are veterans and when they apply for certain government benefits or programs or whatever. Let me I'm just curious. First. They, rightly or wrongly, they are receiving a reward for what they have done. I don't regard that as an advantage. It may be a, a good reward or a bad reward or good or bad on other policy grounds. But it is not an advantage. An advantage to me is something that you had initially. And if you didn't have that initially, the only way you get the, quote, advantage is to do something, which is to serve in the armed forces. Uh, as regards to the uh, educational equity, uh, I, I, I think that we should uh, equalize, if only to get rid of that phrase. <laughs> and, and, I, I, and I seriously think that uh, there's something to be said for getting that issue off the table, because it is a total red herring. But it's going to be, as long as, as long as you don't have equalized spending in the schools, that is going to be blamed as one of the reasons for the other things. And so you want to get rid of it. It's a little like Adam Smith, you see, who argued that, uh, uh, that labor unions should be allowed to exist, which they weren't in, in England in his time, uh, not because they would do a lot for the poor, but because as long as you forbade them, people would say, if only we had labor unions, you see, we, we would have our problems solved. Uh, I know that uh, there's these differences and people fight over them. The argument's been made, if these differences don't matter, which they don't, a ton of evidence suggests the amount of money really doesn't uh, make much difference. In Washington, D.C., they have some of the highest expenditures per pupil and some of the lowest scores in the country. In fact, a few years ago, I saw some data uh, on the different states. Of the five top states at that time, and it may still be true, in test scores, all were below the national average in expenditure per pupil. So it has no, no effect on anything except as a red herring confusing a lot of other issues. Uh, people ask, why, why then do the people in the suburbs fight to prevent this from happening? Because there are advantages. Uh, look, uh, I take Palo Alto High School as a classic example. Uh, Palo Alto High School has six tennis courts, some of which I've used, even though I never went to Palo Alto High School. Uh, they have a large parking lot, so that all the students will have a place to park their Jaguars and so on. Uh, they have a swimming pool, a baseball field, I mean, they're all the works. Now, none of that does anything for education. It's, it's part of their lifestyle and they want to keep it fine. But, uh, no, I, I, think, I think that issue ought to be off the table. Um, I was just curious about what you think of uh, Nicholas Lemon's thesis in his new book, The Big Test. I haven't read the book. Well, what, what, what is his thesis? He, he questions uh, the new meritocracy that has emerged with the use of uh, the, uh, he, he would probably use the scare quotes around the term objective uh, test of academic aptitude. And compared to what? Well, that's my question really. <laughs> well, that's the question the economists always ask. Uh, compared to what? I mean, there's a story that, that someone, a friend in the, economist ran into a friend in the street and his friend said, how are you, how's your wife? And he said, compared to what? <laughs> <laughs> so, it, you know, it, it, no, nothing is easier than, than, than to prove that something human is, has imperfections. Uh, I'm amazed how many people devote themselves to that task. <laughs> 
Yes, Jim Michaels. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, Jim, they're going to bring in the phone for you. Uh, Michael. How is the um, quest for cosmic justice relate to the the um, self-esteem thing which you referred to with Miss Simon before? Yes, well, obviously, people, if, if you're going to base self-esteem on performance, it cannot be equal because performance is never going to be equal. And so all you can get in terms of self-esteem is make-believe equality. And, of course, what happens in the schools is they grade, uh, in many cases, not on the objective result, but on how you did relative to what the teacher thinks your ability was. And so you may do a wonderful job, and they say, well, you know, he really was a very, he's a very bright kid. He could have done better than that, and so he gets a B. And the other student, uh, uh, who really did a lousy job, but, you know, it was a big struggle for him even to do that, and so he gets the B plus. And, of course, what that means is that the whole grading system just becomes meaningless and confusing. Yeah. Professor So, what you've said tonight uh, reflects such common sense, such self-evident wisdom. Why is such a point of view largely ignored in the national press in all of the discussions on the editorial pages and among the columnists when they discuss the subject of income inequality? I guess the quick answer is you have to ask them. Uh, I have no idea except, except that of course the vision of cosmic justice is very beneficial to the people who hold it, even if it's not beneficial to those whom it's intended to benefit. And I think that's one of the reasons that they are, people are so reluctant to give it up, because they feel wonderful. I'm sure that if we, we had had the kinds of teachers that we have today, uh, and they had lowered the standards to all of us as we were coming through the school, and we all ended up uh, going out into the world foredoomed to failure, those teachers would have felt wonderful about themselves. Because they say, hey, we're not leaning on these poor kids. We're taking into account that they come from backgrounds that are deprived. I mean, and particularly in education, this is devastating because it's been shown again and again that in one generation, people can do remarkable things with a decent education. Uh, Jaime Escalon, he did this out in uh, California with the Hispanic kids uh, who uh, scored so high on the calculus test that the educational testing service could not believe it. Uh, so an awful lot can be done. Language is the same thing, the whole notion that you have to have uh, bilingualism. Well, it's, it's known from a lot of research that uh, the child's brain is better able to assimilate languages in those first half dozen years than it will ever be able to do in later life, that the brain itself metamorphoses. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't learn a foreign language until you're 30, you're never going to speak it as well as if you'd learned it when you were five. Uh, and so all these things can be done. Uh, but they're not going to be done as long as third parties think that the purpose of the educational system is to make them feel good about themselves. What do you, th you think that, what do you think about school vouchers and school choice? Do you think that there's any... Uh, well, again, it's compared to what? Uh, in uh, in uh, achieving uh, tr uh, traditional justice. <laughs> Well, I, I, I think they're absolutely necessary. I think that they have their dangers, but the dangers are primarily to those people who have good public schools uh, and who, who would then discover uh, uh, they, with, with a voucher system or who had good private schools and who would find the government uh, intruding more and more into private schools as people went there with vouchers, as they almost inevitably would do. Uh, the, the people at the bottom are so badly off that they have practically nothing to lose. Uh, one of the great disgraces of American education, far more important than the differences in spending, uh, is the way teachers are allocated. That is, typically teachers start out in, 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 a, in a good middle class school, and it turns out they're awful, they'll be moved on to another school, and another. And eventually, they'll start moving them down the social ladder to neighborhoods where the parents are less educated, less affluent, less influential, less able to make trouble. Uh, and so they end up teaching those kids for whom education is their only road out of poverty. Uh, in Cali well, not only in California, but elsewhere, this constant shuffling of teachers around, which is done, by the way, simply because of the high cost of firing them. When I wrote a book on education a few years ago, I said it was $50,000 to fire one incompetent teacher. That has now been more than doubled since then. Uh, and so they move them around. And in fact, this happens so much that there are even names for this. It's called the Dance of the Lemons. <laughs> or, or the Turkey Trot. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, wait, wait, there's a phone coming up. Uh, microphone. I'm sorry. Is uh, the quest for cosmic uh, justice, is it a new phenomena? Uh, does it pertain only to education? Oh, no. Uh, what was its name in the past? Or was there a name in the past? There wasn't a name for it. I guess the people have simply had different notions of justice. I think sort of the codification of it was John Walls' book, A Theory of Justice, back in 1971. But I don't think he created this. I think one of the reasons for the success of his book was that he put into words what so many people already believed, particularly in the academic world, and what many people were already practicing. So this, this notion has always been there, uh, and it's, it's been a source of great confusion. Because people have said, well, there isn't real equality of opportunity if uh, this person has this and that person has that. Uh, in the educational system, it's devastating because there, it takes so many forms. One of them, for example, being even when, the, even when there's no income difference to talk about, there are ability differences. And the educational system, coast to coast, is bitterly set against any form of ability grouping, any form of accommodating to kids who have higher ability. Uh, and one of, the, one of the studies I saw, there was a kid who was uh, in the fourth grade, and he could score above the national average on the College Board SAT in math. And so it was suggested to the principal that this kid should be given something other than fourth grade math. And the principal reacted and he said, no, that would be a violation of social justice. <laughs> yes. you, you've, written it. you've written in the past about if parents knew what was being taught at the college level, and if, if an individual like myself only has so much time, it looks to me like the more serious problem is K through 12 than college level, and so where should I devote my time? Oh my, that is, that is a tough one. Uh, there's more than enough that needs to be done at every single level from kindergarten to the graduate school. Uh, one of the things that protects American education is the, is the fact that American universities are, in fact, leading universities of the world. But that's very misleading. Because some of these universities are so good that it's very hard for American college students to get into them. <laughs> and, and if you uh, separate out the various fields, and you go from the silliest and simplest, like, such as education, all the way over to the other end of the spectrum, math and engineering and science, you find that the percentage of the PhDs which go to Americans are the highest over here in education, sociology, psychology, etc. And then as you proceed across the spectrum, that percentage declines until finally you get over to mathematics and engineering, where less than half of all the PhDs awarded in American universities go to Americans. And so what we really have are international universities on American soil, supported by American taxpayers, with a very large component of foreign professors and students. Um, and, so, and this is what is used to justify the American educational system. But uh, of course, the kids who come here from elsewhere come here with, with much stronger backgrounds. Uh, I was uh, surprised recently to learn that uh, out in Silicon Valley, they're actually recruiting engineers from Russia and India, not because they're necessarily better than American engineers, but because they speak English better. <laughs> Over here, I guess. Well, he's going to, someone else in the back. I'll get to you next. Two things. First of all, um, Professor Sowell, how does the, um, assuming that parents play a major role in the education of students, um, at what, how can social legislation, how can so cosmic justice be created um, when parents do not provide atmospheres conducive to learning in minority, in certain minority communities, in certain, um, New York, for instance. Um, the second, my second question well, wait, is... You, you, are you asserting this as a fact? Um, assuming that parents play a role and the teachers cannot play the only role in the education of students, mm -hmm. um, how can cosmic justice be created in an atmosphere where parents have not created um, a conducive learning atmosphere? Uh, I think, you're, as they say in the law, you're assuming a fact, not an evidence. I know this is one of the great beliefs in the educational establishments, that all problems in the educational establishment are caused outside the educational establishment. Uh, the evidence on that is not compelling. And what is especially not compelling is the determined effort of the NEA and other parts of the educational establishment to prevent this belief from being put to a test. 
If it is the case that the problems are all outside the system, they're in the parents, then why do they fight bitterly against all forms of choice and vouchers, which would allow you to find out that if we take the same kid with the same parents, watching presumably the same television programs as he always watched and so on, having the same attitudes, and transfer him over into a parochial school or some other kind of school, uh, why don't we find out whether, that, whether in fact he will not improve at all, because it's not, it was never the school's fault in the first place. Uh, the bitterness of, the, of this, these battles uh, are hard to exaggerate. Uh, in, in California, they would stay so-called true squads around when people were trying to uh, sign up uh, petitions to get this issue on the ballot. And some of these people were, were, were not above using intimidation tactics to prevent people from signing. Uh, in New Jersey, one of the big companies, I think it was, Pe was Pepsi-Cola, was prepared to give scholarships to low-income kids to go, go from the public schools into the private schools. They were so bitterly opposed to this that suddenly Pepsi-Cola machines in the schools began to be vandalized and Pepsi had to back off its offer. So if it is in fact the case that all these problems originate outside the school system, why then are they not willing to put that belief to the test? I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Well, there's a gentleman here, I promise. That's fair. Uh, do you think that the uh, revival of what is deemed to be merit-based financial aid at the college level will be a force for, uh, 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 for merit in the college admissions process, or do you think the colleges will apply their cosmic justice criteria in the allocation of merit-based aid? They, they may try, but I think the very fact that they've had, they, they've been backed into this. This is not something they wanted to do. In fact, it's fascinating to read in the Chronicle of Higher Education and other places all the mea culpas of college presidents who have uh, found themselves driven to actually awarding scholarships on the basis of scholarship. <laughs> no, no they, they, it is absolutely a dogma of the establishment that aid should not be based upon uh, any form of uh, pr production. It's the only, form of, only place in, the, in the American society where there's absolutely anathema to reward people for doing better. Thank you very much. You can join us for cocktails now next door here. Except that, of course, the vision of cosmic justice is very beneficial to the people who hold it, even if it's not beneficial to those whom it's intended to benefit. And I think that's one of the reasons that they are, people are so reluctant to give it up, because they feel wonderful. I'm sure that if we, we had had the kinds of teachers that we have today, uh, and they had lowered the standards to all of us as we were coming through the school, and we all ended up uh, going out into the world foredoomed to failure, those teachers would have felt wonderful about themselves. Because they say, hey, we're not leaning on these poor kids. We're taking into account that they come from backgrounds that are deprived. I mean, and particularly in education, this is devastating because it's been shown again and again that in one generation, people can do remarkable things with a decent education. Uh, Jaime Escalante did this out in uh, California with the Hispanic kids uh, who uh, scored so high on the calculus test that the educational testing service could not believe it. Uh, so an awful lot can be done. Language is the same thing. The whole notion that you have to have uh, bilingualism. Well, it's, it's known from a lot of research that uh, the child's brain is better able to assimilate languages in those first half dozen years than it will ever be able to do in later life, that the brain itself metamorphoses. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't learn a foreign language until you're 30, you're never going to speak it as well as if you'd learned it when you were five. Uh, and so all these things can be done, uh, but they're not going to be done as long as third parties think that all the standards uh, means simply that people are, are judged by the same rules. But genuine equality of opportunity, as he calls it, cannot be achieved by this, uh, by this method. He's, instead, he says, undeserved inequalities call for redress. Uh, and obviously, someone must have power in order to do that redress. Now, what's called, what I call cosmic justice has been called by some people social justice. But I think they're unduly modest because they're trying to correct not only the uh, inequities that they see in society, they're trying to, oh, to correct 
the oversights of God, or the defects of the cosmos. Uh, when, when some people are born uh, with physical or mental handicaps, they want to counterbalance that. And of course, that's not always caused by society. So that when Rawls says that undeserved inequalities, he includes all sorts of things. And that, that opens up a very large area uh, for, uh, for others. You can find this perspective on uh, justice, the Rawlsian perspective, in many places, from the street corner community activists right up to the chambers of the Supreme Court. For example, a few years ago, a, uh, an admissions director at Stanford University wrote a book in which she pointed out that masses of people that would enable, for example, every poor child in America to get the finest education possible, develop his talents to the fullest, that that policy should not be put into effect if it did nothing for some wino lying drunk in the gutter. And so what uh, Rawls calls the difference principle, uh, I call the wino's veto. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I, I think we have some time for a question, so uh, uh, I'll just uh, start. Well, I'll, I'll uh, Joe? Joe Dolan? Yes. Uh, Dr. Sell, I just got two questions um, related. Uh, one, what, what are your views on ed educational equity and also, for example, veterans' preferences? Well, what is know, educational equity? So uh, it's always nice to know what it is what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the notion that uh, school districts are not receiving equal funding per capita per student. And that, for example, in suburban areas of New York City, for example, uh, the per capita student uh, money might be $12,000 or $14,000, where in New York City it's possibly $8,600. It's, it's that kind of notion that those levels of funding should be brought into balance. And well, on... And the yes, veterans' sorry. preferences, of course, is that... I have a chapter in the book called The Tyranny of Visions, about how, how the vision becomes more real to people than any empirical reality. A classic example was one described by Paul Johnson, uh, Lenin. And Johnson pointed out that Lenin, although he spoke of himself as a representative of the proletariat, had in fact never set foot in a working-class neighborhood in any of the cities he'd ever been in, inside or outside of Russia. He had never talked with the workers and had no idea what they believed about anything. I might add that, all, that uh, he also, after becoming the ruler of Russia, never set foot in Soviet Central Asia, which is an area larger than all of Western Europe, and in which all these doctrinaire schemes from Moscow were imposed for nearly three quarters of a century with devastating results. What he was devoted to was the vision, not flesh and blood people. A flesh and blood people were a complication on the road to realizing the vision. And as it turned out, if he had to kill a few million of those, that was just so much too bad. And of course, we've seen Hitler, Mao, and others with the same approach. Now, fortunately, we have thus far in this country had much more uh, milder versions of this. But you can see also this notion of looking for visions and the abstractions that go with those visions, rather than with flesh and blood people. For example, there's a great deal of uh, talk about income distribution, how the vision becomes more real to people than any empirical reality. A classic example was one described by Paul Johnson, uh, Lenin. And Johnson pointed out that Lenin, although he spoke of himself as a representative of the proletariat, had in fact never set foot in a working class neighborhood in any of the cities he'd ever been in, inside or outside of Russia. He had never talked with the workers and had no idea what they believed about anything. I might add that, all, that uh, he also, after becoming the ruler of Russia, never set foot in Soviet Central Asia, which is an area larger than all of Western Europe, and in which all these doctrinaire schemes from Moscow were imposed for nearly three quarters of a century with devastating results. What he was devoted to was the vision, not flesh and blood people. A flesh and blood people were a complication on the road to realizing the vision. And as it turned out, if he had to kill a few million of those, that was just so much too bad. And of course, we've seen Hitler, Mao, and others with the same approach. Now, fortunately, we have thus far in this country had much more uh, milder versions of this. 
But you can see also this notion of looking for visions and the abstractions that go with those visions rather than with flesh and blood people. For example, there's a great deal of uh, talk about income distribution. And you might think that this is talk about income distribution among people. We're now in the top 20%, then remained in the bottom 20%. So you have this enormous turnover of people in these brackets. And yet the discussions of income distribution are always discussion of the relationships among those brackets, not among flesh and blood people. I think most of us, if, uh, if every millionaire in America went broke, and was immediately replaced by someone in poverty who became a millionaire. Most of us would consider that to be quite a redistribution of income. The way the numbers are used, that would be no redistribution at all. Because the brackets would have the same relationship to each other as before. And they're talking about the brackets, not about the people who are moving among these brackets. In any case, uh, Rawls has what he calls a difference principle, that those on the bottom, he seems to assume that they're sort of permanently on the bottom. Uh, are the acid test of whether a policy is good. If this policy helps millions of other people and does not help those in the bottom, then it should not go into effect, according to Rawls. Now, if you have a fluid society in which anyone who wants to rise has a very high probability of being able to rise, then what you're saying is that you're making the well-being of those who don't choose to do anything be preemptive over the well-being of other people. It means that if someone were to come up with a policy that would benefit masses of people, that would enable, for example, every poor child in America for them to have pretended to make things fair. If there's anything worse than unfairness, it is make-believe fairness. They could, like the College Board apparently is trying to do, pretended that we knew more than we did. And that would have made them feel good. It would not have done much for us. Instead, they forced us to meet standards that were a little harder for us to meet than it were for some other kids, but far more necessary for us to meet, because that was the only way out of poverty. Many years later, I happened to uh, run into one of the other kids from Harlem who w went to that same school at the same time. Uh, and by now, he was a, a psychiatrist. He owned a, a home in the Napa Valley and property out there. In fact, now he's uh, retired, living overseas with servants, while yours truly is still trying to make a living. <laughs> but as we uh, reminisced about uh, things that had happened in the old days and what had happened in between, one of the things he mentioned was that over the years, his various secretaries had commented on the fact that he seldom misspelled a word. <laughs> I told him that my secretaries had made that very same observation and that if they knew Miss Simon, there would be no mystery as to why we did not misspell words. Now, it so happens I became a high school dropout. But what I was taught, which they don't, a ton of evidence suggests the amount of money really doesn't uh, make much difference. In Washington, D.C., they have some of the highest expenditures per pupil and some of the lowest scores in the country. In fact, a few years ago, I saw some data uh, on the different states. Of the five top states at that time, and it may still be true, in test scores, all were below the national average in expenditure per pupil. So it has no, no effect on anything except as a red herring confusing a lot of other issues. Uh, so people ask, why, why then do the people in the suburbs fight to prevent this from happening? Because there are advantages. Uh, look, uh, I take Palo Alto High School as a classic example. Uh, Palo Alto High School has six tennis courts, some of which I've used, even though I never went to Palo Alto High School. <laughs> Uh, they have a large parking lot, so that all the students will have a place to park their Jaguars and so on. Uh, they have a swimming pool, a baseball field, I mean, they're all the works. Now, none of that does anything for education. It's, it's part of their lifestyle and they want to keep it fine. But, uh, no, I, I, think, I think that issue ought to be off the table. I was just curious about what you think of uh, Nicholas Lemon's thesis in his new book, The Big Test. I haven't read the book. Well, what, what, what is his thesis? He, he questions uh, the new meritocracy that has emerged with the use of uh, the... The inequalities, and therefore she would simply not require such tests. Uh, the, the educational testing service is currently engaging in... A, a, 
a renorming of test scores to take into account the social backgrounds and handicaps of the students so that the score will then, again, redress pre-existing inequalities rather than applying the same standards uh, to everybody. Uh, whenever I hear the notions of fairness in education, I think back to my own education. And I think, thank God my teachers were unfair to me when I was a kid growing up in Harlem. Uh, one of these teachers was a lady named Miss Simon, who belonged to what might be called the General Patton School of Education. Uh, I cannot even imagine that Miss Simon gave a moment's thought to my self-esteem. <laughs> Every word that we misspelled in her class had to be written 50 times, not in class, but as part of our homework, and there was always plenty of other homework from her and other teachers. And so you misspelled four or five words and you had quite an evening ahead of you. <laughs> Very little chance of listening to the Lone Ranger. Now was this fair in Rawlsian terms? And the answer is no. Like many of the children in Harlem at that time, I came from and with all sorts of other variables. Uh, we hear talk about the rich and the poor. And what amazes me is how seldom they define what that means. Uh, I remember some years ago uh, talking with a lady who was discussing her financial difficulties. And I said, do you realize that you are among the top 10% of wealthiest Americans? And she looked at me as if I were crazy. But she was. But merely by owning a home in Palo Alto at California real estate prices. She was one of the 10% top. And if she wanted to move out into a, uh, into a tent with her family, she could, have been, she could have boasted of her being one of the richest people around. Unfortunately, if she wanted to move into a, an apartment indoors, also at California prices, she would have been worse off. Uh, most people have no idea what is meant by this top 20% who are so routinely described as rich, where that begins. And I, I just received, before I came out here from California, the latest census data, and uh, any household that has a total income of $75,000 is in that top 20%. That is, any husband and wife making $38,000 a year each is in that top 20%. Uh, these, these are the rich whose taxes we dare not reduce for fear of pandering to entrenched wealth. Uh, uh, they have a large parking lot so that all the students will have a place to park their Jaguars and so on. Uh, they have a swimming pool, a baseball field, I mean, they're all the works. Now, none of that does anything for education. It's, it's part of their lifestyle and they want to keep it fine. But, uh, no, I, I, think, I think that issue ought to be off the table. Um, I was just curious about what you think of uh, Nicholas Lemon's thesis in his new book, The Big Test. I haven't read the book. Well, what, what, what is his thesis? He, he questions uh, the new meritocracy that has emerged with the use of uh, the, uh, he, he would probably use the scare quotes around the term objective uh, test of academic aptitude. And compared to what? Well, that's my question really. <laughs> the, 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 well, that's the question economists always ask. Uh, compared to what? I mean, the, there's a story that, that someone, a friend in the, uh, economist ran into a friend in the street and his friend said, how are you? How's your wife? And he said, compared to what? <laughs> so, it, you know, it, it, nothing is easier than, than, than to prove that something human is, has imperfections. Uh, I'm amazed how many people devote themselves to that task. <laughs> yes, Jim Michaels. Wait, 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 uh, Jim, they're going to bring in the phone for you. Uh, 